Mark Perkansky, also a St. Louis Park native, uh, a, a, writing about a troubadour and a true troubadour himself. Um, uh, I haven't tapped into it yet, but on his website it says that originally he was a magician. Well, he, he's in the right place. Uh, he, he turned his magic into event production. He's produced some of the most fantastic um, shows that we've had here at the amphitheater. The Summer of Love in 2017 and uh, the uh, Bob Dylan tribute. But I want him to come up and talk about his new book, uh, the title of which is Bob Dylan in Minnesota, Troubadour Tales from Duluth, Hibbing, and Dinkytown. Come on up, Mark. It's nice to be back here at my favorite stage in my hometown. Uh, I got some of the best memories of my life took place on this stage. I don't know how many of you people were here during our concerts, but uh, a lot has happened since then, which I'm going to tell you about, and uh, it's wonderful to be back. So thank you for having me. I want to thank Jim for the job he's done, 15 years. That's, a, that's an amazing feat, 15 years. Jim, did you start in 20, uh, 2010 or 9? 209. 209, so you were here the same year as our first concert, through thick and thin. So congrats, and uh, thank you for having me here. Spur of the moment, because I love talking about this book, so I'm glad to be here. All right. So what's been happening is uh, I heard I'm joining a talent show. So I said to Jim, I've been practicing Chinese poetry. I got a little bored during the pandemic and losing loved ones and no concerts booked. So I studied up on my Chinese. So here's what this says. It says, ooga booga, ooga booga, ooga booga. Pretty good? Not that impressive? Christie's much better. OK, actually what it does say is you are watching the exciting 15th annual St. Louis Park Community Talent Show, live on Park TV. That's what it really says. And on this side, we have Booga Ladies. Three Booga Ladies. They're here with a message, OK? This one says, go to ChristyMary.com and check out the vintage Hot Style Jazz EP that just came out. This one says, go to danisraelmusic.com and read all about St. Louis Park's musical treasure and seriously pick up his Seriously album. It's, each album he does just gets better and better. This one says, this booga lady here, her message is, go to magicmarkproductions.com, read up on Mark Perkansky's latest projects. That's what it says, which I'm going to tell you about now. Okay? So let's see what we got here. Hold on. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing my new book, Bob Dylan in Minnesota, Troubadour Tales from Duluth, Hibbing, and Dinkytown. You got to have props. Actually, the book could be called Troubadour Tales from Duluth, Hibbing, and St. Louis Park. Uh, because most of my writings, all, all of my writings are about, took place here. I kept it kind of within the state of Minnesota. Let me just tell you briefly about the book, uh, how I got signed on. There was two other editions of it. It's called, well, the first one was by Bob Dylan in London. There's like a travel guide that came out in early 21 by K.G. Miles, Keith Miles out of the U.K. And then he, I liked the book and I saw it online, was following it. And then he did one in the New York City, The Big Apple. Bob Dylan and The Big Apple came out about six months later. So I was watching this guy, and I knew he's, you know, he's got to do one on Minnesota, right? Bob Dylan in Minnesota. Sure enough, he contacted me. He was looking for four experts on the field of Bob Dylan, and, he, and I was one of them he contacted. And then he also contacted uh, Paul Metza, who's been on this stage with me. He's now living in Duluth. And he contacted Ed Newman, a writer 
an uh, excellent writer out of Duluth, and Matt Steichen, who's in here in Lakeville. So he picked us four experts instead of flying into London, and he had us write these troubadour tales, they're called. So he said, Mark, long story short, he said, right, can you write the afterword? I said, all right, I'll write the afterword. This goes back to January, February of last year. My mother was very sick, and I wasn't concentrating on writing. Everything happened for me in reverse with this book, <laughs> backwards, because I was not planning on writing a book at all, ever, and it just so he said yes to him. I started writing the afterword. Then I said, all right, I, gotta, I was going to write some other things. So I ended up writing about some other things. I ended up writing four or five chapters in the book, which I'm going to tell you about now. So the first one I would like to pay tribute to uh, the founder of our Blood on the Tracks concerts. A man named Kevin Odegaard who founded these concerts for us. And he's had a, he had a rough, uh, all right, Kevin fans here. And he had uh, some cri a health crisis this past January. So we were working on was album, five years of writing songs, and we put one together, came out this January, called Relics. I have these for sale. It's one of his finest albums, and then he made it through his health crisis, and he's doing all right, so I want to say hi to him. I'm going to read a chapter out of the book, because he did an interview in this book. Uh, he was interviewed in here, and there's a lot on his uh, Blood on the Tracks album in here. He did a fresh interview, and he also wrote a little piece. I'm going to read it for you and dedicate it to him tonight. I have a lot of glasses. When you get to be my age, you have several pairs of glasses. One to read, one to, one to see from close up, one to see from far away, one to sleep. But anyhow, you know about that. All right, so I'm going to read Kevin's part here. And it goes like this. If I can find it, I got to find it. All right. No, I bookmarked it. So I'll find it. Yeah, here we go. Okay, chapter 32, Do the Impossible by Kevin Odegaard, okay? If I ever had anything to tell anybody, it's that you can do the impossible. Anything is possible, and that's it, no more. Bob Dylan said that in 1986 to Mikhail Gilmore, Rolling Stone's most captivating voice. Dylan showed up at Gilmore's doorstep in L.A. in a talkative mood, launching an interview that lasted decades. Gilmore went further, pointing out the need to listen to Dylan's exhortations closely. I've always just been about being an individual with an individual point of view. Sometime after I hired on with Dylan, I stumbled on that quote and took it to heart. I wasn't alone. Minnesota kids had an advantage when it came to understanding Dylan's syntax. Lurking beneath the Woody Guthrie inflections, the booing crowd at Newport, the amiable cowboy of Nashville skyline, the roar of the band and croned crooned standards from the American songbook was a telltale sign, an unmistakable root accent from the Misabi Iron Range that we all recognized. When our boy hit the big time, acoustic guitars flew off the shelves across the plains, rivers, and lake cities of the North Country. He was one of us then, now, and forever. So I wrote a couple, I wrote a, a chapter about Blood on the Tracks, the session men and the studio sessions in December of 74. It's kind of a brief uh, chapter on it. And then I also wrote one uh, called The Million Dollar Bash, The Blood on the Tracks Live. I'm going to read from a little bit from that right now, chapter 34. Okay. And there's also some uh, session, uh, chapter on Sound 80 Studio where they recorded it, which is... So it goes like this. This is a chapter from the Blood on the Track sessions, which is a recap of the sessions that the five, six members did. They did a lot of gigs after they recorded the album, and I summed them all up, and this is part of them. From 2009 through 2017, concerts were held in the summertime near my home base in St. Louis Park at an outdoor venue called the Wolf Park Veterans Memorial Amphitheater. They were benefit concerts for Guitars for Vets. We raised large sums of money and had record-setting crowds each year. I was the MC stage manager at all of these shows. These concerts were an outstanding achievement on Kevin's part. Blood on the Tracks Live turned into a larger-than-life communal gathering year after year. During the same period, this venue also had offspring concerts led by Kevin's old bandmate, Billy Hallquist, under the name Salute to the Music of Bob Dylan, and Hibbing native Nelson T. French created successful benefit shows for the Duth Army Restoration. That's a chapter for Million Dollar Bash. And... Um, there's also another book coming out. I don't normally promote other artists, but look for this coming out. It's the full story on Blood on the Tracks, done by Paul Metza and Rick Shefshik, coming out soon, next month. 
you get this, and you read the whole, you put it with the box set of Bob Dylan, more blood, more tracks, and you got the whole story, the trials, tribulations that the six session men of Minnesota, Minneapolis area, recorded and what they went through, and it's still, for my money, the greatest session that ever went down in this, uh, in this city. It's Bob's finest album. All right? All right, moving right along now. So I wrote those two chapters, and then I had to write one for my mom because she was pretty sick and she had passed away. So I wrote, I had told her I'm going to write a story about her, and, I did, and she said, you are? What? I said, I'm going to write a book about Bob Dylan a little bit. She said, what are you going to write about? I said, You're gonna, I said I'm going to write about you. So... I was going to do a, you know, when she passed away, you go through all kinds of things when you lose a mother. kind of had a big effect on me. That's one of the main reasons why I, I wrote this, because I figure people should know outside of the state of Minnesota about her and what a wonderful lady she was. So I'm going to read to you. Actually, I thought when she passed, I was going to contact this guy and say, let's do a concert for Marilyn. And I thought about it and put it here, you know, for uh, do some songs she liked and all that. And. I just had it on the back burner, didn't really do it, got sidetracked, and then this came about. Leading up to today, with this guy, this is my mini concert for Marilyn right here tonight. You're witnessing it, okay? And the song that Dan just uh, performed, I'm going to read you right from the book. From chapter 33, Impressions of Infidels, by me. And it goes like this. It's a whole chapter, but I, I focused on that album, because I subject of that album and the things because Bob was here a lot during that time, wrote some songs the songs here, hanging out a lot here with my mom and there's a bunch of stuff on there in the book about that but I'm going to read you about the song he just performed the song Sweetheart Like You is most definitely written about her many songs of Bob's could be about several different women and open to interpretation but anyone who knew my mom would know this song could only have been about her she was very charismatic and outgoing with a strong personality. But once anyone would get to know her, they could see that she had a heart of gold and was very sincere and real. They could never forget meeting her. She wore heavy makeup, high heels, and lots of jewelry around her neck, bracelets on her wrists, and rings on just about every finger. Bob always thought that she was misplaced and belonged in a bigger city or state, in Minneapolis, uh, in Minneapolis, a bigger city or state. He couldn't believe that she lived in Minneapolis her entire life. The dump he talks about in the song could actually be a reference to living in Minnesota in general. Or maybe it was our house he was referring to. I sure hope not. He seemed to always enjoy hanging out there. She took me to so many concerts over the years, including hundreds of Bobs, and I got to hang out with many of the biggest names in the business. I was very lucky and blessed to have such a fun mother. So that's for Marilyn, who would always be in the front row of these concerts. She was at about five of eight of the nine we did. She was right there where my sister Romy is now and my family here. Hello, everybody there. Okay. So then, last but not least, we can talk all day about this, but we got to, no rain. Uh, I, then I, wrote, I figured, all right, I got to write, you know, 50% of my work in here is probably professional stuff, stuff the day afterward, and then I wrote personal stuff by my mom, and I figured I got to write about me being a magician and showing magic to Bob and what he thought of it. So I wrote a chapter, and I picked the album Real Live. It's a live album that he put out in 1984. Um, and I wrote a chapter about that. And uh, so let me tell a little bit about Bob. He was over and he, wrote, he writes notes on a card. Okay, that's all he, he did the song. So he writes, he gets a thought or a word and he writes the song. A little card like this. He's got like filled to the brim, loaded with potential songs, lyrics, whatever. So one day he leaves it, it falls on the floor and he left. I said, leave it there, Ma, you know, leave it. Maybe he won't come back for it. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure enough, he comes back and he wanted the card. So anyhow, I showed him magic. He was very interested in magic, and I, I was lucky to perform magic for him out in a, a, a talent show that I did with him and his brother were there, and I won second prize at that talent show. And then I did some close-up magic for him, and he, wanted, he gave him some tricks. That's all in the book. You'll read it because I don't want to give it all away. And anyhow, so he said, give me one of your business cards. Give me some of your business cards, and I'll get you some shows. So I give him one of my cards. This goes back to 83, 84, I believe. It's about six months before. I gave him this card. It says the Master of Illusion on it. Here's the card. Master of Illusion, Mark the Magnificent Magician. And my phone number, the area code change from 612, if you remember that. He has to have one area code here. Lots change. But anyhow, about six months later, he comes over to the house with a cassette tape. He says, Mark, put this on. 
So I put the tape on. It's an early, it's an early cassette um, rough mix of the real live album. So we get to it. We're at this, you know, it's, it was pretty close to what the album came out to be. And you'll read more about that in the book. I get to this uh, song, and the, uh, the song is called Tangled Up in Blue. Uh, it's the sixth, uh, so you're hearing that song. Now, this tour was a return to his, I don't know, rock and roll days, whatever. He was coming out of the uh, Christianity phase, and he, so, he, uh, so I'm, he put the tape on, and I'm hearing it in the sixth verse, the sixth and last verse. It's a completely rewritten version of the song. He never did it before the tour. He did it every night, and it goes like this, okay? So now I'm going on back again. I got to get to her somehow. All the people we used to know, they're an illusion to me now. Some are masters of illusion, some are ministers of the trade. All under strong delusion, all of their beds are unmade. Me, I'm still heading towards the sun, trying to stay out of the joint. We always did love the very same one. We just saw her from a different point of view, tangled up in blue. So if you go to YouTube, when you get home, and you punch in the real live version, you're going to hear that. The master of illusion, he put that in the song. I thought that was pretty cool. I, I bootlegged every, every show he did that to her. And I was really thrilled with it. And I also talk about how we kind of co-named the album Real Live together. So that's my story about the book. It's a fun read. <laughs> I'm winding up. It is a fun, fun book to read. It's, got, it's a lot like Bob's personality. I want to thank my publishers, McNitter and Grace, out of the UK, putting it out. It's been doing very well. There's a lot of fun things in there. Uh, and then we have some maps that we did that you, if you get the book, which I have, I'll have for sale here, and I'll be glad to autograph anybody for anybody after the, sh after the show. There's a map of Dinky Town where you can go and see all the spots that Bob hung out in 1959 to 60 when he wasn't going to school. He did, never went to class on his way. He, got the, he, changed, he, left, he came into Dinky Town in 59, went to school as Robert Zimmerman, Bobby Zimmerman, and he did leave here calling himself Bob Dylan. So that did happen in Dinky Town. You'll read about it all in the book, and uh, that's it. It's a labor of love. I hope you enjoy it if you pick it up and read it. Thank you very much, everybody.